Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural, homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Parenting Coach, coming to you from the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my three wildlings and the papa bear in our fixer-upper on the beach. This is episode 47, and today I'm here with Carrie McDonald talking about unschooling. Carrie lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her husband and four unschooled children, has a master's degree in education policy from Harvard University, and is the author of the book, Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. So join us around the campfire and let's get living the family life of our dreams. to thank our new Patreon supporters. Thank you to our new sing-along friends, Martha Flueling, Andrea Patain, Charlotte Elizabeth Ireland, Rebecca Udom Kasmali, Tara McGovern, and Aubrey Goss. And thank you to our new fire starters, Sarah McMacken and Valerie Graham. First, apologies if I mispronounced any of your names, um, because I love you all. You all are what keeps this show going. Thank you for aligning your money with your values and joining the Sage Family Patreon community, where on the first of every month I do a live video Q&A, which is like mini coaching exclusively for Patreon supporters. And you are all welcome to join in the party by becoming Patreon supporters at p-a-t-r-e-o-n slash sage family. Instead of sharing a podcast review with you today, I'm sharing a sage homeschooling book review. So many of you reach out to me to let me know how significant the Sage homeschooling book has been on your journey, and it means so much when you drop that feedback into an Amazon review for the book. So rewarding for me personally, and also makes the book visible to others who are looking for homeschooling information and support. C. Southern writes, This book is a beautiful journey into releasing the expectations that are constantly hoisted onto children, limiting how they learn, when they learn, and what they learn. Rachel has written a thorough, encouraging account of the many ways we can collaborate and learn with our children. I love the way she mixes practical advice and examples from her own conversations, along with the more philosophical why behind taking this path less traveled. Highly recommend for anyone who is interested in honoring and cultivating the love of learning that children are born with. Thank you sincerely, C. Southern, and all the other awesome parents out there who have left such heartfelt feedback in book reviews. For today's adventure of the week in quarantine, I'm sharing something a little different with you. Many of you have asked about how we handle money with our kids, and I do go into that in some detail in episode 32 on debt freedom and 35 on financial independence. But I hadn't quite found an ideal system for supporting my kids in managing their own money until now. Our kids used to get and save up cash, but that was not ideal for a few reasons. They never had it with them. They couldn't spend it on digital purchases. They couldn't learn about interest-bearing savings. And they couldn't manage their finances like we do with online banking. We tried a mommy money system where I just kept track of it and converted it, ran it through my own bank account. We tried just using Amazon money. None of it was really the right fit. And really, kids learn through experience. I can tell them about interest-bearing savings and I can show them ours and include them in family decisions around allocating our funds. But when push comes to shove, they need access to grow into competence. So I did a lot of research and I found a company called Greenlight that seems to provide just what we're looking for. For $5 a month, 
month, each kid gets their own debit card and an app that allows them to set savings goals, transfer money from checking to interest earning savings, donate to charity, receive allowance, even earn money for chores. We don't pay our kids for chores, but we do sometimes pay them for bigger extra jobs when they're looking to earn money. And then I have the parent app on my phone where I can manage settings and oversee it all. We're really excited about this, which is why it's our adventure of the week. My kids are checking the mail every day for their very own debit cards. So I thought I would invite you all to try it out with us as an answer to that question of how to support kids in learning to manage money. If you sign up for the free trial using the link in the show notes, which is greenlight.grsm.io slash sagefamily, which I know is annoyingly not podcast friendly, then you'll also be supporting this podcast as an affiliate, which is a nice bonus. But they are not sponsors of the show, and if you don't think this will add value for your family, then don't do it. If you do want to join in the homeschooly fun along with us, then sign up. And after we get to really dive in and try it out, I'll come back and update you on how it's going for us. Greenlight was my solution to a need for our family and many of yours. But for your adventure this week, what problem can you solve? What need can you fill? What question can you answer? I find that this pursuit of growth is often an exciting adventure. If you want to see photos and videos of this adventure, I'll have to snap a picture of my excited kids with their debit cards once they arrive. Then head on over to sage.family on Instagram and follow along. Before I launch into my conversation with Carrie, I want to warn you that her internet connection wasn't great. While I know that's not ideal to listen to, the conversation is definitely worth it. So if she momentarily cuts out, it's not your phone, and she'll come right back in. Thank you for your patience and understanding, as so many are scrambling a bit to adjust in the makeshift workspaces of stay-at-home orders. I read Carrie's book, Unschooled, and knew immediately that it needed to be added to my recommended homeschooling book list, which is like my unschooling uncurriculum, if you will. So I'm so excited to share a conversation with you today, Carrie. Now share your story with us. Who are you and how are you connected with unschooling? Well, it's so great to be with you, Rachel. Yes, I'm uh, the author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom that was published last spring by Chicago Review Press. I'm also a senior education fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and I write a frequent column for Forbes on innovative K-12 learning models. Um, and I really decided to write Unschooled because I felt like it was important to give a historical context to the idea of self-directed education, to frame it as an educational philosophy um, that goes back really long before John Holt uh, coined the term unschooling in 1977. And uh, he coined the term in the second issue of the uh, and not of the uh, Growing Without Schooling newsletter, which was the first newsletter for homeschooling families, really uh, triggered a lot of the modern homeschooling movement. And so a lot of people associate unschooling with John Holt and, uh, and his important work really in uh, being a pioneer for the modern homeschooling movement. But the ideas of self-directed education go back much further than that. And I trace all the way back to John Locke, uh, and the philosophers throughout the 17th century and beyond up into the 20th century that was more relevant to kind of modern interpretations of homeschooling and unschooling and self-directed education. And then, of course, um, introduced John Holt and some of the thinkers, um, even after John Holt, to kind of carry the torch of uh, what we would consider contemporary unschooling. Yes, your book is so juicy for all of us geeky mamas who like... <laughs> want to dive deeper with this stuff and understand it better. You did a fantastic job of that. Thank you. Yeah. And I also really wanted to spotlight the different ways of approaching unschooling and self-directed education. So the book itself um, really focuses on individuals, families, organizations, and alumni who've either learned through unschooling or are providing an environment for children to learn. 
And even under the kind of unschooling umbrella, there are just so many different approaches and so many ways that individuals, families, and organizations approach uh, unschooling and self-directed education. I wanted to provide that kind of broad landscape uh, to show of the many ways that this can be done. Yeah, it really it really does that and it does it well. So thank you for all of that. And I think, you know, another thing your book does is that a good step in the process of questioning the status quo is to learn about how we got here and the foundations that our current system are built upon. Um, you do a great job of this in your book. I know you talked about giving the context for how the unschooling movement has sort of evolved, but also how the current system that we're in has evolved. So I'd love for you to give us some context for how we got to where we currently are. You're right. This is one of the um, real fun pieces of writing this book. Something I've been interested in for a long time is the history of American compulsory education and compulsory schooling. And so in the very before I get into the history and philosophy of self-directed education, I trace back all the way back to the pilgrims uh, in uh, 1620 and look at how we got here in terms of American education. And so soon after the pilgrims arrived in what was what became Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, they arrived in 1620. By the 1640s, they had already passed the nation's or the colony's first compulsory education laws. And what these laws did was indicate that there was some state interest in educated citizenry, um, but the compulsion at the time was on cities and towns of certain sizes to provide education opportunities for families that wanted those opportunities. So um, if you had a small town with fewer than 50 families, you were expected as a town to hire a teacher uh, to provide education to any in that town, if you had a town that had 100 or more families, you had to open and operate a grammar school. And again, the town had to collectively uh, make sure that this happened. So the, the responsibility was on the city and town to provide education resources for families, and they were fined if they didn't do that. Uh, that all changed in 1852 when Massachusetts passed the nation's first compulsory school schooling statute. And then all of a sudden, uh, this very broad and varied understanding of education as enco encompassing all kinds of different approaches, apprenticeships, homeschooling, public and private schooling, becomes confined into a public school classroom, what was called the common school. And for the first time, parents were now the ones compelled to send their children to school under a legal threat of force. So the, the responsibility now shifts from just a general landscape of providing educational resources with the cities and towns responsible for that to now parents uh, being compelled to send their children to school. And there's a whole history that I go into about sort of the anti-immigrant sentiment at the time, the fact that there was a large onslaught, Irish Catholic immigrants coming into and this real kind of Americanized these Irish Catholic immigrants into what was the dominant Anglo-Saxon Protestant ethos of the time. So even though these common schools were purportedly secular, they had Protestant teachers, they had Protestant texts, they had the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, it was very much uh, focused on that kind of dominant culture and trying to assimilate immigrants. And many uh, Irish Catholics just said, no, thank you, and started of parochial schools. Uh, so it's an, an interesting history when we think about where we got there. Um, and, then, and then I think we're moving, though, it, you know, in the late, we must begin to move in the late 20th century and certainly now in the 21st century away from this singular notion of compulsory schooling into more educational freedom, including uh, homeschooling as being, I think, a real catalyst for that, as I said, beginning in, with the modern homeschooling movement in 1977 uh, into kind of the larger education choice um, movement. There seems to have been this historical tug of war between parents and the state over who gets to decide what's best for children. And we are still very much entrenched in that tug of war today, particularly with the recent article in Summit out of Harvard 
calling to illegalize homeschooling. And I actually appreciated the way you didn't shy away from that, this political side to the homeschooling conversation. And I'd love to give you the space to speak to the critics who say that families should not have the right to educate their children. Um, usually they're saying for fear of abuse and an uneducated citizenry, at least that's what the most recent article said. Um, so I'd love to just kind of give you the space to speak to that. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think like most of your listeners, I was taken aback by the Harvard Magazine article in the May-June issue of Harvard Magazine, the alumni magazine for Harvard, um, calling for a presumptive ban on homeschooling. And the article was entitled The Risks of Homeschooling, which was really a one-sided portrayal of homeschooling that focused on an interview with long-term, uh, long-time law, Harvard Law School professor Elizabeth Barr, a much more extensive 80-page uh, paper in the Arizona Law Review that was also recently published. And so the Harvard Magazine article um, really tried to capture what she was talking about in that much more in-depth Arizona Law Review article. So when I read it, I uh, immediately decided that I needed to write a letter to the editor of Harvard Magazine. I went to graduate school at Harvard and um, just thought that this was a completely inaccurate portrayal of what is modern uh, homeschooling in, in the United States. And so I wrote a letter to the editor of the magazine and then published that at my site at fee.org. Uh, just pointing out many of the glaring errors in that piece. And then uh, fortunately, a lot of other homeschooling advocates also uh, jumped on the bandwagon and, and, and responded um, to these, to this sort of mischaracterization of There's so much in the, in Harvard, the Harvard law, uh, excuse me, the Arizona law review piece and the Harvard magazine piece that we could talk about. I think, um, you know, one of the things that is most egregious to me is just this sense that we need to have a presumptive ban on homeschooling to ensure child safety <laughs> uh, when, you know, so many homeschooling families choose homeschooling because their children were in schools that were not safe, that yeah. there was widespread bullying or there might have been other kinds of abuse. And so they saw homeschooling as an exit ramp. Um, from that experience. Um, and I, and I think other families, you know, that my, myself included, you know, we, I chose homeschooling for my kids and unschooling because I wanted to give them more freedom, mm -hmm. uh, and more flexibility in their learning than they could get in a, in a standard classroom. So, you know, one of the things that Bartholet talks about is authoritarian for children. And yet, potentially even more authoritarianism when you send a child to a conventional school. Uh, and certainly calling for a presumptive ban on homeschooling is about as authoritarian as it comes. So there was just so much, I think, in that piece um, to, to respond to and to really focus on. You know, I will say um, that it, it, it's worthy of debate and sort of talking about parental rights versus child's rights and it's certainly relevant to a discussion on uh, unschooling and self-directed education. We're, of course, providing children with as much freedom as possible as individuals. I think the challenge, though, you know, historically, um, the courts have upheld what is known as the liberty interest of parents to care for and educate their children as they, as they see fit. Um, and what I think Bartholet is, is suggesting is that we move more towards a child's rights framework where the state sort of grants rights and decides whether or not parents are worthy of being able to homeschool. And it sounds like it would be protecting children's rights, but I fear that when we give um, the state power to determine um, what kinds of uh, education lifestyles are deemed worthy, that that could ultimately limit rights. And we see that certainly in many European countries who are moving towards this sort of interpretation of children's rights over parental rights. It ends up leading to much more state intervention and potentially limiting children's rights. For example, um, in the case of unschooling, you know, I'd worry that if we, if we move toward a child rights perspective, that um, anything that doesn't look like public schooling 
would be uh, deemed unworthy. So I think it is something that unschoolers should be thinking about. Yeah, and it's tricky when when it's framed in that language, <laughs> like calling it like, you know, moving in a child's rights direction. Like that sounds awesome. Like I would definitely be in favor of child's rights. But what it's really doing is it's putting the power in the hands of the state to determine what is in the best interest of each individual child and how can they possibly do that when they don't even know the child and they obviously have their own uh you know their own different interests at heart and i think the heart of a lot of the objections is this assumption that children are safer in schools like that abuse happens at higher rates um, in the homeschooling community and the data just does not support that um, even just anecdotally, you know, I sadly have known and and worked with in my experience as a family therapist, a great many number of children who were abused and 100 percent of them were in school, um, whether the abuse happens in school or happens in the family school is not a, a does not protect children from abuse. And then the other tenant that they're sort of pushing is that children need to be in schools to produce an educated citizenry and that is one of the big reasons why we chose to homeschool or to unschool um, is because i don't believe that school produces um, an educated citizenry at the same level that we're capable of doing by living in the real world and allowing our children to learn as we live in this society that we want to prepare them for that's right. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, Bartholet talks our review article is um, idea of parental rights absolutism, which, of course, I don't think anybody would advocate for, you know, in cases where parents are abusing ch children, those children then should be removed from that home. Um, but the idea that you are sort of presumptively singling out a particular group of families as potentially, you know, do, having wrongdoing against their children, I think is a really dangerous precedent um, with no, you know, it's sort of this idea of guilty until proven innocent. You have to prove to us that you're not going to abuse your children before we allow you uh, to educate your children as you see fit. And you're right that, again, in um, public schools, you know, we're often seeing headlines abound of uh, teachers being arrested or convicted for physical abuse against children. Um, a 2004 study by the U.S. Department of Education found that one out of 10 public school students would be sexually abused by a public school educator by the time they graduated from high school. Uh, so you're right that that the public schools aren't necessarily living up to their own standards uh, of safety and security for children. And so uh, to remove the rights of parents to be able to, again, either exit that system or educate their children as they choose, I think is a dangerous, uh, again, a dangerous precedent. Yeah, I agree. Um, so let's talk about that learning piece. I think many people start from the assumption that schooling is exclusively synonymous with learning, but that is not so. Um, talk to us about how children, and all humans really, how they learn. Well, I mean, I think all of us who have children know how curious children are, young children are, before they ever go to school, right? They're always questioning, they're always um, eager to learn and discover, you know, Peter Gray, the Boston College psychology professor, big unschooling advocate who writes the foreword to my book, talks about this, about this exuberance of young children, this drive that young children have to explore and discover their world, to learn their entire native language, to learn to walk and cra crawl and walk and run. Uh, and that doesn't, that drive for learning doesn't go away when a child hits preschool or kindergarten age. Uh, you know, we tend to erode that through a system of schooling that really focuses on conformity and compliance um, and to some extent really rejects originality and imagination um, and, and individuality. So, you know, I think that that is one thing that, that unschooling advocates would really focus on is that we want to allow those natural drives for learning and discovery to continue that if we don't halt that with a system of top-down education, whether it's in a school or even replicating school at home, doing you know, what, again, 50 million students here in the, in the United States now uh, basically doing school at home, homeschooling during the pandemic, 
um, it's the same type of thing where you're, you're having this top down imposed curriculum, you're removing the free will associated with learning. And, and unfortunately, um, in that process, I think causing a lot of kids to not enjoy learning and to not have that sense of personal agency, that they're in charge of their own lives, that they're in charge of their, their own destiny, that their interests matter, that their talents are important, um, because we're really focused on one singular mode of education, which is schooling or some variant of that. Yeah, I, I shared a conversation with Peter Gray in an earlier episode of this podcast, and he's incredible. I'm, <laughs> he, I'm, I absolutely fangirled out over it. Um, and I, there's this sort of misconception that school, like we have this picture, it's, it's someone who has been certified in some way, and they are lecturing to you or assigning to you, and you're filling out worksheets. And that is what learning, quote unquote, looks like. But we're ignoring the fact that from birth to age five, your ch- your child learned so much. I mean, I, w- I have parents who will say to me like, oh, my, my kid wouldn't learn anything um, if they unschooled or if they homeschooled. So your kid learned nothing from birth to five? Like, how did they learn to walk? How did they learn to talk? Um, all of that is unschooling. And then the same thing on the other end. Like, did you learn nothing once you graduated from high school or college? Like, so in the last however long it's been, 5, 10, 20 years, um, have you learned anything? How did you learn it? Like you you probably had a need to understand something better. So maybe you read about it or asked people who knew more about it than you did, or you just started working with it with your hands and started to understand it better. I mean, all of that is learning. And sometimes we our society just has the, these blinders on people for, for what learning looks like that just puts it in such a narrow view. So I'm hoping that people can really expand their view of what learning looks like so that they can start to see, you know, in the peripheral part of their vision, all the ways that learning actually happens naturally and that you can, you can lean into that and hold more space for that and let go of sort of that center top down stuff and, and the learning sort of expands and fills out and it works. You can trust that it works. Yeah, it's really interesting that you bring that up because I think um, one of the reasons I would say that unschooling and self-directed education has gained popularity, um, there's even data that I talk about in the book uh, through the U.S. Department of Education showing the number of homeschoolers who are focused more on an informal or unschooling approach to homeschooling has increased. But I think just general interest in unschooling has grown uh, over the past decade is because of technology and innovation that I think we as adults begin to realize how we how we learn and how we can become curious about a topic and now all of that information is available at our fingertips that we can uh, devour information that we can learn uh, through technology and through this democratization of knowledge and information. You know, it used to be that you went to school because that was where the experts were. That was where uh, the books were. That was where the knowledge was. And of course, now we see that all around us. We can take a master class and learn <laughs> from experts. Uh, right now, during the pandemic, we have, you know, world famous authors and illustrators sharing their knowledge lot free, live streaming uh, every day. Um that enables us to learn almost anything. So there's just so much more access to knowledge and information that enables us, I think, as adults to really rekindle those natural drives for learning. And I think that ultimately uh, is leading a lot of parents to say, gee, you know, maybe I should rethink conventional schooling for my kids and grant them some of this freedom to learn that I'm now experiencing as an adult. Yes, I think like historically an argument could be made that there was sort of this gatekeeping system, perhaps out of necessity, that you know not everybody could afford to have a library of books, and books weren't as readily available, and the teachers were perhaps imparted with knowledge that the people who are living in these small communities couldn't access outside of that classroom. But that is not the world we live in today. And in the past, perhaps more of a focus on 
like memorizing facts that you couldn't, you didn't have access to, um, out, you know, again, outside of that classroom. So where you kind of had to memorize them to take them with you, that's no longer the case now. I mean, everyone has a calculator in their pocket. They can look up the date that World War II started in seconds. So like uh, uh, there's, yeah. there's sort of in the unschooling community I have found, there's been this shift where we can sort of ride that wave along with technology and adjust kind of the gaps that we fill in and the focus for our efforts um, based on what is readily available. And there is so much readily available right now. Right. And then really recognizing the mismatch between our kind of dominant conventional education system and the realities of the 21st century innovation era. This, you know, the idea that we have a standard system of schooling, like you're saying, that's still emphasizing uh, rote memorization of facts and that in, in some cases is becoming even more standardized with regular testing requirements and so forth. Um, when what we think about in the 21st century is how can humans differentiate ourselves from robots? Um, how can we maximize human intelligence uh, instead of artificial intelligence? And what are those characteristics that make us human. It's things like creativity and curiosity and ingenuity and an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and those are the qualities that are so often um, diminished through a system of conventional schooling. And so if we think about unschooling as a way to facilitate and cultivate those important human characteristics that are just so critical now uh, in the 21st century. Oh, I could not agree more. And I, unschooling is such an ideal way to support that natural learning process, to take advantage of all those things and really foster those qualities that are most needed. And I'm hoping you'll define for us what unschooling actually is and then share what it looks like for your family as an unschooling mom of four kids. Well, thanks. So I, I define unschooling in the book as really disentangling education from schooling recognizing schooling is one way of being educated, but is not the only way. And as I just mentioned, perhaps not the most preferred way for the realities of the 21st century, really focusing instead on interest-based learning, figuring out what your children are passionate about, figuring out what their gifts are and their talents, and then recognizing how much learning can come from supporting those interests. And as adults, connecting those children, our children's interests to available resources, both real resources in our community, as well as digital resources that, of course, right now we're all uh, exclusively relying on during the pandemic. Um, but one of the really great definitions of unschooling that I that I use in the book comes from Cleveland State University education professor Carl Wheatley, who defines unschooling families as, and he calls this, who, who, as families who primarily or entirely let children interested in and use little or no formal adult chosen curricula. And I really like that definition, partly because uh, it says little or no formal adult chosen curriculum. I think sometimes families might say I use a little bit of curriculum, so I must not be an unschooler. And I really tried in the book to make uh, this as expansive as possible and to show all the different ways that you can support self-directed education as an unschooler. The other thing I like about, about his definition is uh, this idea of adult chosen curriculum, because I think schoolers are sort of anti-curriculum or now um, conventional classes or um, from teachers, and, and, and it really couldn't be further from the truth. I think that the definition really focuses on, is the child the one driving that process? Um, and I often use the example of my older daughter, who's 13, who takes Korean language classes and has been meeting with a Korean language tutor for a couple of years now, three times a week at the local library now over Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and that interest in Korean came from her interest in martial arts, which she started taking um, just prior to the interest in Korean language, and was really fascinated by these weapons that were named, that had Korean names, and these forms that she was learning that had Korean names, and then wanted to take some Korean language classes and learn more about Korean culture and history. And so she started with Duolingo, which is a free online language learning software, but wanted something more, more rigorous. And so I was able to connect her to a native uh, Korean speaker who, with whom she meets and absolutely loves it. She 
uses a very formal curriculum. She takes quizzes and tests. She, uh, you know, is really going through the grammar and um, and kind of regimentation of we as what we think of learning a, a foreign language. Um, and loves it because she knows that at any time she can stop doing it. So there's this freedom to quit. There's this non-coercion associated with it. And it's tied to her overall interests in this particular topic as well as her goals. She wants to speak flu fluent Korean and hopefully later in her teen years um, spend at least a semester in South Korea uh, immersed in the language and culture there. So uh, so again, unschooling doesn't mean no curriculum or no formal classes or instruction. It just means that it's the child driving that process and also knowing that they can uh, quit that process whenever it makes sense for them. I think there's a, a tremendous amount of freedom and liberation with that. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that perspective because that's something that I, <laughs> a misunderstanding about what <laughs> unschooling is that I'm often butting up against where... You know, I'm saying like my my kid will mention like, for example, my teen is doing French and Duolingo right now because she wants to go to Paris. She wants to spend time in France. And um, so she'll, you know, mention in passing that she's doing French and Duolingo and, and somebody will say, I thought you guys were unschoolers or, <laughs> or we actually joined this book club and one of the members said something like, you guys are joining the book club. I'm so surprised. You, I thought you, I thought you guys were unschoolers. And I looked at her and I said, well, unschoolers read books. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much misconception of that, like where people sort of have this vision of unschooling as being, I don't know, just sitting in sitting in the house doing nothing. I mean, so my kids engage in all kinds of things. We utilize curriculums or classes or even teachers, but there's this self-directed, non-coercive component, like you said, where all of the, the learning tools that they engage in are sort of through the doorway of an interest of theirs or based on this, this challenge they're experiencing that it can support or this um, passion they have that it can nurture. Um, and they know that if it's not, if, if it's no longer a fit for them at any point, that they are welcome to, um, to exit, you know, which is like a really important component that, that, that aligns with that natural learning philosophy and that unschooling sort of way of living and learning. I think that's right. And, and you know, Peter Gray uh, has a wonderful blog post on psychology today that he wrote a while back calling, saying that basically the greatest freedom is the freedom to quit, this feeling that you really are in charge of your own destiny. Yeah. And that also, that freedom also results in, it fosters responsibility, because um, if you're not leaning forward, sort of taking up all the space and making all of these choices for your child's education, then they get to grow into that space and they get to, you know, that the flip side of that freedom is that independence and responsibility that they they get to step into, which is a really incredible thing to witness. Right. And that was actually one of the most eye opening pieces of writing the book was looking at the different ways that individuals and organizations negotiate freedom balanced by responsibility in unschooling. Um, and I talk about A.S. Neal, who is the famous founder of the Summerhill School in England in 1921 that is about to celebrate its 100-year hmm. uh, anniversary next year, one of the first sort of democratic self-directed schools. Um, and he all that ended up being uh, a bestseller back in the 1960s. And in the book, he talks about uh, what his term is freedom, not license. And that is really about freedom balanced by responsibility, that one individual's freedom cannot negatively impact another's freedom. Uh, and it was really great to see the different ways that, that families, individuals, and organizations negotiate that. In some cases, if it's a self-directed school, they make sure that young people are involved in the process of self-governing, um, that they are actively engaged in um, making and enforcing any kinds of rules or policies in the in that school. This is the Sudbury model of schooling, for example, that I talk about in the book. And then even in within families, you know, what are what are some of the responsibilities and roles within families to make sure that one person in the family's freedom doesn't negatively impact another person's freedom. Yeah, that freedom not license really speaks to that misconception of unschooling as passive parenting, which the two are not 
at all the same thing. My kids don't go around hitting other people. And I say, oh, well, they're free to do whatever interests them, <laughs> which is, again, just sort of this misconception. So yeah, I really appreciated that you covered that piece to it in your book too, that um, that, that freedom not licensed piece was a really good point. Um, so what about literacy and numeracy? I actually have a whole episode on reading with a reading specialist slash unschooling parent and a whole episode on math with a math teacher slash unschooling parent that I'll link to in the show notes. But I'd love for you to share how the research informs your belief that yes, even literacy and numeracy can be trusted to develop naturally. Right. So there's a lot of really great data that you probably get into in, in the in these episodes about, again, natural literacy and natural numeracy, this idea that we need to force children to read, for example, and that the ages in which we're expecting young children to read are getting earlier and earlier, I think is really problematic. Some good research that I cite in the book talks about young people who are learning without schooling. The average age of reading proficiency is about eight and a half years old. And that could be late for many um, reading, you know, curriculum expectations right now in schools and could lead to sort of mislabeling or misdiagnosis of children who are just not quite developmentally ready yet to read. But what we find often is that whenever children are allowed to kind of learn to read on their own timetables, again, being widely supported by adults, surrounded with a literacy-rich environment, read too frequently, and so forth, uh, when children are, are, um, are reading proficiently, which sort of, again, operates on this sort of bell curve where eight and a half is, is the midpoint where most children would be uh, proficient readers, as soon as kids hit that proficient reading point, they're off to the races. I mean, they're off and, and reading really complex things pretty quickly. So, you know, even in my book, I have 10 and 11 year olds who, you know, didn't start reading until that age. And then their parents said within, you know, a couple of months, they were reading Wuthering Heights, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just really complex reading. Um, and in some ways, it's similar to other, other developmental milestones, right? Like, I mean, I think of my older daughter, who didn't, uh, who was an early reader, ironically, but was a very late walker. So she didn't start walking until she was almost 18 months and then ran down the hallway. I mean, <laughs> and there was sort of no, you know, incremental, my other younger ones, uh, who had more of this kind of textbook, textbook crawling and then, and then, uh, you know, walking and stumbling and taking steps here and there, and then finally working up to proficiency with walking. Natural mastery tends to have this invisible foundation work and then a, a burst. Yes, right, right. And so and we and we don't seem terribly alarmed um, by a child who might walk a little bit later, but yet we become frantic over children <laughs> who are not reading proficiently now, even in kindergarten, pushing reading uh, reading uh, curriculum. But certainly by first or second grade, all of a sudden there's all of these red flags when it could just be that the child isn't quite ready. But when they're ready, they will take off. And again, we want to be focused on supporting children. We want to make sure that, you know, I, always, I say in the book that if parents truly instinctually feel that something is not right, um, that their child, you know, should be reading or something else is wrong, you know, trust their gut and um, potentially, you know, have an eye exam or talk to a, you know, a reading specialist and so forth. But often it's just our cultural expectation around reading is so focused to younger and younger ages that we're not letting kids develop that reading mastery at their, on their own timetables. And as a result, often our, we're, we're not only um, causing children to internalize this idea that they're not good readers, that they're, that they're not competent in literacy, but um, could really set them up for not enjoying reading. Because I think one of the, the things that you find with so many young schoolers is they are voracious readers because they're able to read things that really matter to them. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, one of the funny things that, that I, I think is really interesting is a lot of kids um, don't particularly enjoy these early readers that we have, uh, yeah. you know, the Bob book yes. or Dick and Jane. Oh, my kid um, hated and, those. Right. And so it takes a little bit of time for them to kind of catch up to themselves because they really want to be reading, you know, the Daisy Meadow fairy books or they yeah. really want to be reading 
the Hardy Boys, and it just takes a little bit of time for them to get up to the point where they're uh, where they're able to do that. And then again, they're off and running at that point. Yeah, my eight year old, his his singular drive, and he is just throwing all of himself into into learning to read really, really well is to read the Harry Potter series all on his own. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we just, we read together every night. There's, I mean, he wants to read the menu at the restaurant to order his food pre pandemic. (laughs) And, you know, there's just, if you have parents who read and you have books in your home and it's, it's virtually impossible to not develop any sort of relationship with the written word yourself and I've seen that you know three times with my own kids and then in all of the other families that we're connected with who are on this natural learning journey and then there's also evidence that you can look to in studies and such and this is with numeracy as well like there was that one study that out of wasn't it out of um um Sudbury where if you have an interest in math that you can learn like K through five in 20 hours or something Mm -hmm. like that there was that other earlier study in a in a um low-income public school where they did no math instruction for the first five years and then in the sixth year they were completely caught up um Mm -hmm. after that at the end of that one year of instruction and I think one of the things too that you that you mentioned earlier is that when kids are allowed to develop on their own sort of natural timelines they take with them a higher proficiency and a, a greater interest in the subject matter for the long haul which makes sense if you think about the fact that you know if they're not reading exactly at five they're made to feel like they are disordered or broken or reading is not for them and and their time with books is filled with frustration and shame and you can step out off of that path and outside of all of that and then no matter what age they start reading they 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 can have a really positive relationship with it that's right i mean i think unschooling is really about uh it's the utmost of personalized learning, right? It's really figuring out what, how your child learns, what they're passionate about, what the right approach is for them and recognizing that every child is different. So when we have more of this one size fits all standard schooling model, um, there's very little room for deviation in terms of curriculum and in terms of approach. Um, despite teachers' best efforts, I mean, I think teachers do a remarkable job given the constraints that they have. Yeah, I, I completely You're agree. really able to see, yeah, you're really able to see my child in this moment and see what a wide, you know, I think of my, um, my older daughter, who I mentioned was a really, was very happy with the sort of conventional uh, early, you know, reading, early literacy skills. For my older son, he really learned to read by becoming interested in music and then I would print out the lyrics to some of his, which happened to be like Beatles songs, the words as he was listening to the music. And that was something he was really interested in. And then later he wanted to read um, the Amazon customer reviews of different <laughs> products that he was curious about. So a very different path than um, a conventional reading path, but is absolutely loves reading and reads really complex books now. So I think it's just being open to those different ways of learning um, and being able to customize learning as an unschooling parent. Ah, oh, yes, I completely agree. My youngest, he learned to write his letters by learning to play the ukulele. Like he wanted to learn to read the sheet music so he could play the songs that he was most interested in. And you have to like sort of label the notes on the different on the different lines. So, yeah, I, I love hearing stories about that, too. If I think it's really inspiring for other people to kind of see the nonlinear way that a lot of these skills develop naturally on the unschooling path. I'm glad you brought up the ukulele, if I can just um, yeah. jump in there, because my uh, nine year old daughter became interested in, well, she's always been very musical, but didn't really want to learn an instrument until earlier this year, just around her ninth birthday, um, and wanted to do the ukulele and just absolutely loves it. I mean, just really took off with it and has a real talent for it. And I, when I think about certainly how I learned in school, I went to K to 12 public schools, uh, just outside of Boston 
and the there was this expectation that you hit a certain grade and then you have to pick your instrument which mm-hmm. was you know very limited choices that you had ukulele certainly wasn't one of them <laughs> at the time um but everybody had to learn an instrument and it just, I find it really remarkable because my other kids aren't very interested in learning a musical instrument. They might have other appreciation for music in different ways, but not at this point, not in learning an instrument. And so again, the idea that we have to have every child be the same and learning the sort of same thing or engaged in the same kind of content at the same time um, really doesn't allow for that personalization and flexibility of of human nature. Yes, we sort of on the on the mainstream schooling path or in that mindset, we have this belief that we have kids are sort of these tabula rasa, these blank slates, these empty vessels, and we just have to pour every skill and every every bit of knowledge that any human in our society could ever potentially use into them. And that's just absurd. It's like cluttering the attic of your child's mind. Like I I just it doesn't make sense because not everybody is going to be interested in those things. Not everybody's going to be engaging in those things long term. Not every interest or subject or or musical instrument um, is going to be relevant for every human being. I mean, I it's sort of I mean, you can you can take it in more of an academic sense in that, like, not every student needs to learn calcul- calculus. Not every person is going to choose a vocation that would involve that um, all the way into things like music. And I'm often encouraging parents that if they feel if they are pressuring their kid to um, to learn something or to practice something or to do something that to instead ask if maybe it's them who wants to learn more about that thing or practice or do that thing. So if you are really pressuring your kid to learn to play the piano, I suggest that you stop pressuring your kid to learn to play the piano and play the piano. Like a lot of times we have these sort of (laughs) interests that we're not giving ourselves permission um, to engage with. And so we're putting it on our kids. So if you find that you're doing that to maybe flip it back on yourself. And if you want to learn a foreign language, then learn a foreign language. You don't have to live these things out through your kids. Right. And I, and I, the adult in the unschooling relationship in an unschooling family or um, a mentor or an educator in one of these self-directed learning centers or Sudbury style schools is to expose children to all kinds of different experiences and opportunities, which again is so easy to do, so much easier to do now when we have so much information digitally available to us. Um, but not to, like you're saying, not to pressure children. So expose them, let them know, you know, various opportunities, let them know you support them, but, um, but don't pressure them to do that. And one of my favorite quotes, I, I mentioned that I, in the book, go back to the writings of John Locke um, as sort of the beginning, the foundation of this idea of non-coercion and self-determination. One of my favorite quotes from John Locke is, He said, it is one thing to persuade, it is another to command. Mm. Uh, And I think that that speaks to some of of what, you know, what we're, you know, you can always make suggestions just like you would to a friend, like, hey, you might like this book. Yes. (laughs) Or I watched this movie yesterday, I thought thought of you, you know, like, that's not, that's not coercive. Um, It is if you say, let, you know, sit down and watch this or sit down and read this book. Yeah, yeah. Invitation is like my favorite word. Like we had a ukulele and a guitar hanging on the wall of our house. <laughs> like, you know, so like providing the materials and extending invitations like, hey, I hear you listen to that song over and over on repeat. Do you want me to um, pull up a tutorial for you to play it on the ukulele? And then if they say yes, awesome. But also they know that they have that freedom to say no and that yeah. that's OK, too, just like it is for me. That's right. Okay, so people sometimes ask me what I would recommend in place of the school system that I say no longer serves children or society very well. And my answer is to expand the library model, which is this Mm -hmm. wonderful example of a government funded community resource that brings together people of all ages to learn in a completely self-directed way with support available, materials you can use on site or check out, classes you can attend. Um, So I... I'm a big fan of libraries, and I was so excited to see you mention that in your book, in addition to unschooling resource centers and unschooling schools like Sudbury Valley. Um, if school as we know it was no more, what would you recommend in its place? 
Well, I adore the library, too. Um, and in fact, in the final chapter of the unschooled book, where I talk about an unschooled future, I quote Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, and his um, quote where he says, I was made for the library, not the classroom. The classroom was a jail of other people's interests. The library was open, unending, and free. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that that's such a great uh, picture of, again, what non course of community-based learning could be. So, you know, absolutely thinking about the public library, um, Yvonne Illich's book, De-Schooling Society from 1970, that was part of, I, I think, you know, I talk about part of the, the impetus for the modern homeschooling movement, modern unschooling. Um, he talks about webs of learning that we would think about in terms of libraries, but even writing in 1970, of course, not imagining the true webs of learning that we now have through technology uh, and digital resources. And I think another thing would just be thinking about going back to this model or, or this thought of compulsory education versus compulsory schooling. So the idea that, you know, we could, uh, you know, I could get around this idea of compulsory education where communities have to provide education resources for families, um, whether that's teachers or schools or libraries or a combination, but that we're not compelling schooling uh, as the one mode of achieving education. Yes. Yes. I love that. And I think it's, it's such, it's a valuable question just to touch on because I feel like oftentimes conversations about homeschooling, particularly around the rights of families to choose to homeschool tends to always kind of find its way to that point like that. Well, society needs schools. So I love when people are adding a perspective or solutions sort of answers to that question for what, what the answer how we can meet the needs that school is providing in other non-coercive and perhaps more beneficial for society and families and children ways. Right. I mean, and again, libraries are really the perfect model, I think, in explaining self-directed education to people who don't really understand it because, um, you know, again, it's com- community supported, but it's non-coercive. You can choose to go or not. You're not mm-hmm. compelled to go from ages six to six to 18 or, <laughs> or whatever it might be in your particular location. Um, there are mentors and adults available, knowledgeable people to help you with whatever you are interested in and, and to show you connect you to various resources, but you're not required to do something at the library. Um, you can take classes there that are offered that you might like, but you don't have to. You can come and go as you choose. So there's just so many parallels, I think, to, for, um, in thinking about public libraries as, as a perfect way of really facilitating community-based self-directed education. I completely agree. All right, I want to move into talking about adolescence a little bit. Um, I am working on an entire episode on the topic of teens, but I was so happy to see that you included um, a chapter in your book on that topic. I have noted on this podcast that mainstream families tend to struggle the most in their parenting with toddlers and teens because those are the two seasons Mm -hmm. when control-based parenting fails. (laughs) So my takeaway from that chapter of your book was that teenagers need freedom and community. And as long as you honor Mm -hmm. their growth in those two areas, they are awesome. And as the mother of an unschooling teen, I wholeheartedly agree. What advice do you have for parents who are fearful of the teen years? Right. I think that um, you're absolutely right that teens crave and need developmentally um, community and independence. And if we can provide them with that opportunity, um, they will thrive. It doesn't have to be school. I think sometimes when teenagers might ask to go to school that maybe were previously homeschooled, what they're really asking for is more connection to community or more independence. Um, You know, Sometimes it is that they truly want to go to school. And I think if we value non-authoritarian parenting and non-coercion, then we should be open to that possibility and and look at um, schooling environments that might be suitable for us as parents and for our children and come to some compromises there. But sometimes what teens really want is, again, community access and independence. Uh, Fortunately, and I highlight this a lot in the book, there are these um, self-directed learning centers that are sprouting. There's the Liberated Learners Network that um, the pioneer of the 
self-directed learning centers for teens by Ken Danford uh, out in Western Massachusetts. And now there's a network of these self-directed learning centers around the country, and they continue to sprout that provide a lot of this community for teenagers in an unschooling type of space. Um, in the chapter, I talk about Not Back to School Camp, which is a, a long time, long running summer camp um, read, run by Grace Llewellyn, who wrote the book, The Teenage Liberation Handbook. My teen is so excited to go there. Yeah. <laughs> She's got all the details worked out. She was going to go this year, but now with the yeah. pandemic, we're not so right. sure if it's going to happen. So she is like absolutely going next year. She is so pumped. And the, the people that I interviewed for the chapter on teen unschoolers who did it, participate in Not Back to School Camp really found it was a profound moment for them, um, really helped to clarify a lot of their goals and uh, future plans. And so that can be a great springboard. I talk about Project World School led by Lainey Liberty who uh, and her son Nero, who run these immersive um, teen travel programs where you become embedded into particular cultures around the world for multi-week periods and work together uh, and learn together. That can be another great uh, avenue for teens. Um, job experiences and apprenticeships. You know, we have teen labor force participation has gone down dramatically over the past decade uh, and I think is a real loss for teens who really want to and, and need to be connected to the adult world that they'll enter. So finding opportunities for apprenticeships, internships, as well as just general teen work, I think can be really valuable. Yeah. And what about launching? Like if we're saying no to that school assembly line of like good grades and test scores, college, job, then what might a path to success look like for unschoolers? Well, I mean, I think a lot of unschoolers do go on to college. Um, you know, Peter Gray uh, and Gina Riley did a survey of grown unschoolers where they found that many of them go on to college and that they take community college classes as a teen to enable them to get there. So I think that that's certainly a pathway for unschoolers to think about um, and could really be aligned with unschooling goals as well and, and also help to defray a lot of the costs of college and universities when teenagers can enroll in community college classes, um, either in person or online and develop college credits, then they can often enroll in a four-year college or university as a sophomore or a junior, really saving quite a bit of money. So that is certainly a pathway. And and as Peter Gray and Gina Riley found, um, unschoolers do quite well in college should they choose to go and they go on to have meaningful careers. Interestingly, their study found that more than half of the grown uh, unschoolers in their survey were working as entrepreneurs <laughs> in fields that were connected to interests that blossomed during their childhood or adolescence, really speaking to this idea of personal agency and, uh, and freedom that, that unschooling provides. But there are some alternative pathways as well. I talk about um, this program called Praxis, which is an apprenticeship program that provides opportunities for young people to develop skills and, and, um, and, and credentials sort of outside of a college environment where they're uh, signaling to employers that they are competent workers, but that they don't need a diploma as a signal uh, from a college to, sh to show that. Um, and that that is a job placement opportunity for them. I think there's emerging models as well, um, especially in people who are interested in any kind of technology. Many of the um, big software companies, for example, don't require college degrees anymore. They want you to be programmers and learn to program. And now that there's so many of these coding camps and coding classes that people can take as well. So I think we're, we're fortunate that we have um, more alternative pathways to adulthood for young people today. Yeah, I think like it can start with like redefining success, like what success, what I was told success looks like is very different, you know, than what it's going to look like for my kids. And even if you want to say it's just um, by nature of the fact that the jobs are different. I mean, I mean, you had some statistic in your book. What was it like 60 percent of kids, their jobs have not yet been invented or something like that? That's right. I mean, kids in, in elementary school today, you know, will work in jobs that have not yet been, been invented. Yeah. Uh, and the World Economic Forum also finds that some of the most in-demand jobs and occupations today did not even exist five or 10 years ago. So how can we possibly know, um, you know, how to train children for future 
jobs and careers when we don't even know what those are. Instead, we should, again, be providing all this freedom, providing these resources and these experiences and, and then putting them in charge. What are you passionate about? What are you talented in? And, and encouraging them to pursue to pursue those talents and those passions. Yeah, unschoolers would have more of those inspiration age skills like creativity and self-direction that can be helpful in things like entrepreneurship. So yeah, Peter Gray's survey of grown adult unschoolers. If you guys haven't checked that out, I'll link to it in the show notes so you can check it out. It was It's a good one. All right, now I asked the Sage family community what questions they had about unschooling, and Noelle asks, does unschooling look any different if your child has labels like ADHD, dyslexia, autism, etc.? Is there a child that unschooling won't work for? That's a really great question. Um, interestingly, Harvard researchers about a year and a half ago came out with a survey, uh, a research results, excuse me, that found that in states that had a kindergarten cutoff date of September 1st, so you had to be five years old by September 1st. Um, in those states, the children that turned uh, five in August and so were among the youngest in that entering kindergarten class were 30% more likely than pe their peers who were born in September uh, and therefore were almost a year older to be diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and I think it speaks to, again, what we were talking about earlier as these uh, unrealistic expectations, particularly on young children now uh, in schools, whether it's literacy or behavior or this expectation that you have to sit still and pay attention that's just simply um, uh, unrealistic for young children. Um, and so what you'll find a lot of the times, particularly with ADHD, and Peter Gray again talks about this quite a bit as well, is that it's a mismatch between the standard classroom environment and uh, how children naturally learn. And so again, unschooling can be an exit ramp for that and to really encourage children to be who they are, to grow in their own timetables, to get up and move around if that's how they learn, to be energetic and that's okay. Um, so that's one thing that I would say. I think um, you know, many families will tell you that they uh, chose unschooling or homeschooling because their children have special needs that were not being uh, met in the conventional classroom. And they find that they're able to, again, have this flexibility outside of that conventional classroom to meet those needs. Um, and in, in, and federal, you know, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act requires schools to support children with special needs even outside of the public school classroom. So there is access to uh, resources for families who choose to exit the conventional school system but still want access to special needs resources. Yeah, I think disorders are often a reflection of evolutionary mismatch in the environment. I mean, even in the DSM definitions, like the, the main feature for any diagnosis is that it you have like impaired functioning or you're sort of unable to be successful in the environment, um, which I think often we're sort of overlooking that environment piece <laughs> uh, that we're, children were not really, have not evolved to be successful or to thrive sitting still and quiet in a chair for six hours, um, not having any freedom or autonomy or sovereignty, you know, having to ask to pee and not being able to, I mean, just it's, there's so much in the environment that can can make a lot of natural ways of being um, express themselves in pathology. Um, so I'm going to link to an episode I have on neurodiversity. But the beauty of unschooling is that you get to completely customize the environment and rhythm to what your child needs. You aren't pressured with any musts or shoulds and you aren't limited by any existing structures. Um, we have neurodiversity in my family, and that is a big part of why we unschool. It's remarkably advantageous for all of the square pegs who would otherwise be hammered into round holes. There's a flip side to all of the traits that we're told are less than in a classroom environment. And those very traits in an environment that actually suits them um, can become strengths. 
<laughs> Let's move into our deep dive. So the show notes can be found at rachelrainbolt.com slash podcast 47, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. What are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic, Carrie? And of course, we're going to link to your unschooled book, which is fantastic and everybody should read. Thank you. Yeah, you can visit my uh, my website at c.org slash Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y. There you'll find links to all of my articles, links to my book um, and uh, social media accounts and so forth. I'd also highly recommend the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, self-directed.org, which has um, abundant resources about self-directed education, uh, re- research by Peter Gray and others, community forums, links to local group meetups and so on that can be really helpful and then um, really most uh, helpful I think is connecting with your local community homeschool community or unschooling community through Facebook groups or local listservs um, finding people who think like you either in your local area or online uh, virtually certainly now uh, is I think a real great way forward yes thank you so much Carrie for sharing your time with us here today and your perspective and your knowledge and your wisdom um, I feel smarter for having talked to you so hopefully some of the listeners are experiencing that same charge oh thanks Rachel this is great mm-hmm.